Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural Coffee Microcaps Appendix 4C reporting wrap. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps. This is a, a new event series for us where we're trying to bring you uh, Appendix 4C reporting companies um, in a timely fashion uh, around the exact time that their Appendix 4C has come out. Uh, and this is the first of three events that we're going to be doing this week. I'm delighted to say we've got 12 uh, great companies lined up. The first four you'll be hearing from this morning. I'm just going to quickly run through these introductory slides and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. Um, the criteria for the companies presenting is pretty much the exact same as our regular morning meetings. Uh, market cap under 300 million companies in revenue and approaching cash flow break even are indeed already profitable. We don't generally tend to have companies from the resources or the biotech sectors. So it's uh, what we call industrial microcaps, which is a catch-all for microcap uh, financial companies, media, uh, technology, industrial products businesses, and uh, basically the, the kind of uh, whole gambit of sectors outside of those two that I mentioned previously. Uh, we have four companies presenting over the space of two hours. Uh, each company gets a 30-minute slot, which we're roughly going to break down into a 20-minute presentation and 10 minutes of Q&A. If you do have any questions for our presenters, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. just makes it easier to moderate the, the, the Q&A session from my side. Uh, please note that the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps uh, YouTube channel tomorrow morning. Uh, you can follow Coffee Microcaps on Twitter, YouTube, as I said, for this recording and for the events coming up this week, and indeed for all our other Coffee Microcaps morning meetings, which we have concluded about 40 of at this point. Uh, LinkedIn for some additional long form content. I also write a weekly paid subscription newsletter where I profile one interesting microcap stock every week. Uh, you can get that on the Substack newsletter platform. Uh, first up, we have MSL Solutions. I'm delighted to be welcoming back um, Pa Howard, who has presented at a Coffee Microcaps morning meeting in the past. Uh, then we are going to cross to Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Dr. Stephen Snowdy is going to be presenting on behalf of Visioneering Technologies. Again, Stephen presented a couple of months back for any of our regular attendees. So he'll be giving us an update. Uh, and then we're going back to Sydney. We've got Johanna, CEO and MD of PropTech, excuse me, PropTech Group, who will pre be presenting. And then finally, we'll be going to Melbourne. Uh, Mr. Neil Joseph, CEO and MD of Australian Primary Hemp, who is also a returning presenter. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I know Pat is patiently waiting in Brisbane, ready to start sharing on his side. Pat, if you want to get your presentation up, I'll let you know uh, once I can see it on this side. And just go, yeah, there you go. Looking good, Pat, ready to go. Thanks very much, Mark. Have you got me? Yeah, I've got you. Thank you, and thank you all. Um, and it's a lovely series having Appendix 4C. It's a, it's a nice lead in, and hopefully, as we've had four positive operating cash flows in a row, this may be our last uh, invite to an Appendix 4C uh, application. But it's um, a uh, pleasure to be able to give MSL Solutions uh, a lead in today. Um, to get take you through the company and give you a little bit of company overview before we go into the Appendix 4C results and some of the recent uh, contract wins. Uh, what I am gonna do for any of you on the phone, uh, or any of you watching, please pull out your phone if you'd like to. Uh, pictures with a thousand words and you can go to that QR code with MSL at the bottom and actually go through an ordering process of our software. You'll be able to take your time, obviously, um, be able to order your soft drinks, food, and just imagine you're in a, in a stadium, imagine you are in a, uh, 
a large venue of any sort and you'll be able to see how in-seat ordering works. You'll be able to do that as we walk through. So I'll take you through while, uh, while I'm talking, you'll have something to play with and, and feel free to see how easy our, our software is to deploy and it's fully integrated back in the system, which I'll go and talk you through. Um, just going through the slide, uh, we're listed in 2017. We have a market cap of just around 55 uh, Mill, we had a little bit of sell-off after our Appendix 4C, after our, uh, a little bit of a spike a couple of days ago when we were the leading tech stock on the ASX. I think that was Monday. Um, our technology is a uh, SaaS platform provider, and depending on if you look at our golf systems or our point-of-sale systems or some of our digital assets, uh, we have some real leading products in that market. To give you an overview of the business, we have 118 employees, venues across 30 countries, um, and we have headquarters in the UK and Warrington. Um, that might be helpful when we talk about Manchester United or Manchester City a little bit later on. We are a Stadia um, POS business in sectors, and we're obviously headquartered in Brisbane, obviously very excited with the 2032 Olympic City bid. We are in the Gabba, we're in the MCG, Stadia Australia, um, MCG for those um, that know Australian Stadium. So we have some good locations. We also have a business, uh, a golf business based out of Denmark, Denmark. So we have five major offices, but obviously headquartered in Brisbane. Um, overall, we have 4,000 plus venues uh, just in Swift alone, which one of our point of sales of $5 billion worth of transactions going through our tills. And to give you an idea, the value of that to many of the payment providers is significant. Um, any payment provider should be able to tell you what Pat Howard spent at a given store, $25 at a store. We can tell you what they spent that money on. Uh, and that's why that loyalty component, a point of sale, and I think I'm going to talk you through that point of sale mentality. We also have a 50% uh, market share through one of our resellers, Lick Legends, through our Queensland. We're very strong with uh, clients such as Maryvale in Sydney, the Young Hotel Group in Sydney, uh, and we have locations throughout every state in Australia and a very strong presence in New Zealand, let alone our other locations. Um, the US, as an example, is our fourth biggest client, but we're very um, we're only at the uh, embryonic stage of getting into that. Uh, Swiftpost, one of our four point of sale uh, business, or one of, one of our businesses has 26,000 point of sale um, terminals and it is across 26 countries. So Australia and New Zealand dominate our market, uh, but we have markets in Europe, we have markets in the US, uh, throughout um, locations in Asia, and usually that's through partnerships with other um, software providers. And just to go into our golf business, um, for anybody on the call that he has a golf handicap, you will know the name Golf Link. You are already a customer of MSL. For everybody that has a golf handicap in Australia, through our Golf Australia contract, you pay a $3.50 fee. And as many of you may have seen in the media, golf has had a renaissance through COVID. And I'll go into that as well. We had a business called Golf Box that I discussed that does a very similar thing in Europe. And the Golf Australia app was one of the leading uh, downloaded iOS apps this year, once again, an MSL product. And we managed through GolfLink over 11 million rounds of golf in Australia in, uh, in Australia last year alone. To give you an idea, and I think I just want to talk you through the product to give you a better understanding of what we provide. If I take you down the right-hand side, um, point of sale is not a cash register system like the old days. It, it offers loyalty, think frequent flyers, your gold, your silver, your bronze. It does offers. We can do check-ins and reservations. You can do a counter ordering, at seat ordering, um, uh, click and collect. It does sell serve kiosks, the mobile ordering that hopefully a few of you have just experienced. We can do proactive marketing and promotions throughout and, and deliver that out to the customers as well. So it has a very strong customer facing element. It also then has fulfillment. So if any of you did just order, and I promise you, if you ordered, don't worry, we're not, we're not billing you at the moment. Um, it does go straight back to the kitchen and it goes back, straight back to the inventory module. So you have a fully integrated system that can order your next set of inventory, shift inventory around, uh, completely communicate with your, um, your kitchen or your staff in stadia, venue, large pub, club, uh, it does all your stockroom dashboard, web dashboarding and reporting so that if you need to move inventory around during a major stadium 
and we might talk to Manchester City in a little bit, it's 450 terminals. Uh, it does have a significant amount of an end-to-end -end solution so that you can really manage your operations no matter where you are, uh, both off your phone, off a tablet, off the, off the traditional kiosk. It also has a back office, an integrated back office uh, with terminal management, product management, and an open API. And what does that mean? An open API allows us to integrate in with those names like me and you, like Uber Eats, like, uh, and using Doshi, uh, which we'll talk about, has um, an ability to integrate with most of those reservation, most of those at table ordering, in-seat ordering. So whilst we have our own solution, and we're very proud of that own solution, we make sure that we don't want to have barriers to sales by uh, being arrogant to be closed off to other uh, market-leading products. Um, if I go to the third dot point on the left-hand side, um, I know that we're in Wembley, the MCG Stadium, Australia, Eden Park. And for every um, golf location, which might only have, say, one or two point of sale solutions for that golf management system, uh, the Eden Parks, the Stadium Australia, MCG will have 400. So the scale and size of those large locations is pretty significant. Going to the 4C, and Mark, that was um, uh, the rationale for uh, bringing us on today, so important to talk to it. Um, we've obviously had a very positive um, last quarter with $2 million operating cash flow, and the green in that is government subsidies. So you can see that over the period the government subsidies have disappeared uh, through the, or largely disappeared. There's a tiny bit coming still out of the UK in that last fourth quarter. Um, new management came in at the end of uh, Q4 19, and we've been working on the process to turn this around over the period. So we've got some very strong operating cash flow, strong EBITDA results. Um, we've obviously have done our fourth consecutive quarter operating cash flow on 5.7 million for the year. Um, we'll talk about those contracts um, a little bit, but we've also then done deals with um, a technology partnership with hospitality app platform that provider Doshi, uh, which is CBA, CBA owned venture through its group C, uh, X15. And that allows you to connect in with significant amounts of third party apps, all those household names, Google Eats, um, Menu, uh, uh, open table, etc. Um, we also have a cash balance now, 5.4 million as of the 30th of June 2021, and has grown since then. And we also have undrawn facilities. That puts us in a, a very strong position to continue to look at MA opportunities. Uh, our acquisition of SwiftPOS during the year, which was a provider we we're the leading reseller of was done without any capital raising. And we saw that as a very strong position to be able to grow without being diluted to our capital base. So we believe we're in a really good position for further acquisition. And then we've also uh, got a strong position to go into organic growth as well. Just quickly on two um, deals, and this is pretty profound. Our results last year uh, have been held back by the UK being in lockdown for a significant amount of that time. And I think our share price at the same time was uh, correlated with the exposure to this space, but the reality is it hasn't been heavily um, affected in the new sales in the last quarter. Um, ASM Global, uh, we have relationships with them both in the UK and Australia and working with them to have our US exposure. In Australia, we're in the International Convention Centre at Darling Harbour, to pay Convention Centre at Christchurch, Brisbane Entertainment Centre, Newcastle, Darwin. Um, so we have a significant relationship with ASM. And that led to a 22-site deal uh, in the last quarter of last year, with most of that revenue being recognised in the last quarter. Um, it, those 22 sites include stadia, arena and race courses. It's a three and a half million dollar deal, but the most material of that is effectively three hundred fifty thousand dollars of recurring revenue um, to uh, MSL. Um, what hasn't been recognised is the deal with Manchester City. Uh, we've just done the Manchester City and their training ground in Manchester. Now, for those of you who are known, Manchester City has a significant stake in a significant amount of sites. 
uh, globally, and we have started those conversations for other sites around the world. Uh, the deal itself um, has a recurring revenue of sort of $270,000 Australian. The overall deal is over a million dollars, but the rest, particularly the hardware, is re relatively low margin. Professional services is relatively low margin, but the recurring revenue is where we get significant amount of stake in the business. So um, both of those deals um, signal a real resurgence and return in the UK. And that is the part of the business that obviously was uh, fairly break even last year. We're really excited about what we're going to see in the UK next year and, and very positive about where we can get to. So just in giving, um, you know, we didn't do just do an appendix 4C. We actually gave some guidance. Uh, our EBITDA guidance for next year for, for our results is $3.5 million of EBITDA. Uh, it's inclusive of COVID related um, of around about a million dollars of government subsidies. Um, there is some R&D capitalisation in there as well, but overall the turnaround from last year is going to be around a like for like, around about $4.4 million. Uh, over the two years um, since new management came in, that's nearly an $8 million turnaround. So the EBITDA line over those two year period. We're also very buoyed by the growth in golf. The last state of play report shows growth of over $250,000 in the social golfers. Uh, and through memberships and handicapping and the release of our new MSL scoring app, which will allow digital scoring, both social and membership, we're really excited about where we can partner with Golf Australia for further growth. Uh, we manage nearly 1,000 golf clubs out of the 1,500 in Australia, uh, very much in the mid to lower tier to try and help golf clubs be able to have that opportunity. And then obviously we leverage our point of sale into those same golf clubs. Um, also, for the next year, we have full year contribution from SwiftPOS. As I said, we've had a 20% growth in revenue in the seven months we've had SwiftPOS. We see that adding even further. In FY22, incredibly positive, high margin, point of sale, lots of locations, increased payment data as well, and the opportunities there with trailing commissions and digital revenue is high. And then we're also looking forward to the bounce back in the UK, building on the recent wins of CFG, which is Manchester City Group, and ASM Global, which provides opportunities to keep growing, MSL's recurring revenue in the future. So overall, um, a very positive Appendix 4C. Um, we're very excited and we'll progress on our figures for the full year. They're unordered at this point, but obviously um, we're given the best guidance we can. Uh, and with cash in the bank and looking for opportunities with a raised uh, share price, we believe we're in a really good position for an FY22, um, both in the UK, Australia, and our other base businesses out of golf. Uh, Mark, I might hand back to you at this point. Uh, thanks, thanks, Pat. Your questions have been flying in. So um, let's see if we... Uh, can get through to and I actually had one or two emailed in ahead of time for people who couldn't join us. Um, first one is kind of linked to a question I have. Um, does MSL still have seasonality in operating cash flows? Um, you know, on a quarter to quarter or um, or maybe a half and half basis, or what what's the kind of forward looking split of international revenues versus Australia based revenues? Yeah, so so let's take a couple of the questions. I think there's a misnomer here that um, we make majority of our money on transactional income, and often um, you know, the uh, venue pays uh, annually, quarterly, monthly. But uh, you know, we saw during COVID we were only affected by three hundred thousand dollars. That was over a twenty-five billion dollar business. That was a full impact this time last year um, to our recurring revenue. So. Um, these are usually annual uh, licenses uh, and we haven't started going into the transactional um, uh, revenue model. So we're reasonably well protected in saying that. As we come out of um, uh, COVID, I do expect to move more to a transactional uh, business model where we share the ups and the downs. Uh, as I've said, we have a significant amount of transactional income going through our businesses and uh, providing POS and payments together is a logical uh, collection and, and logical way to be able to leverage the payment data going through our uh, point of sale. Um, our Golf Australia contract is monthly. Um, you know, it's $130,000 regularly coming in the door. Our second biggest contract is with Doshi. Uh, that's a, a, a monthly trailing commission coming in the door as well. So the seasonality isn't uh, significant. 
and um, and I think probably a misunderstood part of our business. Um, in terms of the split, the easiest way to think of the business is 60% Australia, 20% our business golf box out of Europe and 20% out of the UK. But I do expect the UK to start, start um, winding up its share during FY22. Okay, and then um, I know we talked about this the last time you were on. Um, updates on cracking the US market for, for, for the golf business. Um, I know you said it's uh, 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 you have to take a state by state approach. So, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, but it's really, you know, California is the big one. Maybe with the US opening back up, give us uh, an update on where, you know, real life business development uh, can happen again. Yeah, so we've seen a significant increase off a very low base on the US golf uh, and North American golf. So Canada is the third biggest golfing country in the world. So we've seen um, uh, some significant increasing in the US, but it's still not even 5% of our market at the moment. So we're really excited what we can do there. Um, led by Swift Pulse and Point of Sale into that with our golf systems. So we're seeing significant opportunities, but, and as you said, Mark, um, and I think many businesses are seeing this, the US has opened strongly uh, and, and really they're, they're talking about um, COVID as a distant memory. So we're seeing some positive results, but I, I don't want to overstate where we are today, but we are getting significant interest in our golf management system and our world handicapping. And as a reminder to the group, we are still the only business that's been able to export world handicapping, golf management and tournament management collectively as a package. Um, there are businesses out there that do one or two of these, but nobody else does all of it and can put package it together. Um, in relation to customer onboarding and the process that entails, um, to what extent is that a barrier to entry for competing products and services? Uh, look, not significant, as I hopefully showed in that first slide, and hopefully a few of you um, ordered, ordered on your phone. There's no hardware there at all. So we can deliver a very lightweight solution. Um, I think for larger stadiums and particularly for larger integrations, that's where it comes down to how quickly that can be onboarded. But we, we have particularly in our venues, pubs and clubs, we've got a very good system to be able to do that and we can do it remotely, which I think is pretty important when you're doing an upgrade process, say, for Sydney at the moment. So we're utilising this downtime with pubs and clubs in Sydney to upgrade to the latest version of SwiftPost, which is uh, version 10, which allows um, version 10 to use the uh, order away module that you all trialled on that on that second slide tonight. Um, a question then on uh, acquisitions, Pat. Um, what type of acquisitions are you looking at? Is it more... Uh, point of sale systems that you can just kind of plug in with the, the rest of it or is it um, more on the uh, on the on the golf side with some little bits of functionality <laughs> that can even no, it, your position there yeah. or where where are you thinking of in terms of acquisition yeah, look, and, and, and mark um, the as I said, in the golf side of the business, we, we genuinely have tools that are scalable. And so we have been able to export to different countries. We're currently in the middle of two tenders in two top 10 golfing locations in Europe. Or they're globally in the top 10. So we believe we have, with through World Handicapping Tournament Management and Golf Management, we have tools that uh, we're not looking to acquire necessarily. We do look to partner. Uh, significantly with with um, uh, particularly US-based uh, organisations. That goes back to your previous question. But on the POS side, we're seeing a significant amount of consolidation and the ability to look at different solutions for different markets. Um, Swift POS has been leveraged in the UK, but there are other markets and other POS providers which are EBITDA positive that are out there that we can look to acquire uh, and to go from 4,000 to 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 venues and also then that looks at that payment scaling as well, which we think has significant opportunity. So the pause consolidation we see is real. Uh, we've seen a little bit of it in the market and we're making sure that we are um, looking for those opportunities as long as they are creative, uh, both from an EBITDA revenue and customer, uh, customer level. I know you did touch on it in your um, presentation, but we've got a question on monetizing the 5 billion in transaction value flow through the, 
the pause business. Um, maybe if you could just expand a little bit on it or give us some of your thoughts on what could potentially be done there. Yeah, so as I said, and this is, um, we are getting a significant amount of attention um, from payment providers. And for the simplicity of this is because um, they don't know um, what is bought in a location, we do. And so to be able to give preferences, manage your inventory, manage your SKUs, which are highly profitable and high turnover, versus those waste of time SKUs, which you, um, you know, eventually go out of date and, and run away, uh, run out because um, they're not utilised. Giving that micro data to if Mark Tobin's preferences is, um, you know, a coffee or a Coke or a rum and Coke over a... Um, you know, it's probably a Guinness with his accent, um, you know, being able to know what his preferences are in those locations to your clientele is really important. So being able to take a transactional clip of the business and provide POS as part of that is a logical solution that, that many of the payment providers are talking to us about. Now, how much for how much? Um, you know, we're not suggesting... Um, a million miles, but you know, I'm sure you can all do the maths on one percent, and we believe that opportunity has been presented and has been presented significantly. So we we just want to make sure that um, when we're talking to business, they're aware of our transactional data. We're building that capability, and we're making sure that we can work with providers. We have a few in trial that are on revenue only, so we'll, we'll um, provide our point of sale and the payment gateway on a percentage basis. If they're closed, obviously that does become seasonal. Um, if they're open, then we share in the upside with some caps and columns. So that's the model. Um, it's very much a trial at the moment and, and seeing how much that appeals to the market. Uh, then another question, Pat, on um, pricing and pricing power available to you when you're recontracting with customers to, to push through price increases. Um, I guess a bit like accounting software guys, um, the further the functionality goes, the more kind of mission critical you are to uh, their business and the bigger pain it is to switch away from, from, from your offering to somebody else's offering. Would that be fair to say? Well, oh, very fair, Mark. And look, I'll, 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 and it's not sexy, but I, uh, inventory management, it is an absolute nightmare to change your inventory module. And then many of the POS providers don't have an inventory model, module. Ours is completely integrated. And if you want to take all your inventory out of, out of your stock and then re-enter that into a new system, that's a nightmare. So, yes, uh, the fact that we have an integrated inventory module, the fact that it runs through to your kitchen, it does your sales promotions, it's fully integrated from your mobile all the way to the back kitchen and, and uh, supplies and ordering and stock management is incredibly critical. So with SwiftPOS, we get very, very little churn. Um, you know, Golf Link, I think, uh, is to all the Australians who have a golf handicap, appreciate that's... We're the only player in town in that regard and working really closely with Gulf Australia. So we're really proud with some of those products that, that there is a very, very little churn. Okay, and then I think we've got one final one. Uh, I know you've kind of answered that already. We won't uh, redo it. Um, I think that's it, Pat. I think we'll leave it there because I do know uh, Stephen is joined us and standing by thank you very much for uh jumping in uh last minute to present this morning and giving us an update on everything uh msl and while we might need you for an appendix 4c in the future uh hopefully we can get you back on a on a morning meeting in a, in a couple of months time really appreciate it mark and thanks for the time for everybody and thanks for pulling me off the bench there's thanks pat <laughs> stop sharing your screen i know that uh, Stephen is patiently waiting for us in atlanta georgia let me just get Stephen to start sharing his presentation coming up now yes i can and if you just go to uh, slide share mode Stephen. yeah that's uh, perfect. How do you hear me, Mark? Uh, I can hear you now, Stephen. That's perfect. 
Excellent. Well, um, I was just, you know, after hearing all that, I was just going to put my slides up and actually go play around uh, if that suits well. Yeah. Or yeah. maybe I could go through this. Yeah, you can go through which, which, whatever works best for you. Okay, very good. Are we ready to get started? We are indeed, whenever you are. Okay, well, thanks for joining everyone. Good morning uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, where it's uh, about 7.30 in the evening, so a little bit later in the day uh, from what you are just starting in your day. And uh, I'm the Chief Executive of Visionary Technologies, uh, which I'll be telling you about today. Uh, I have been CEO since about 2013. Uh, but been active with the company since about 2008. In 2008, I was a venture capitalist and led the first institutional round that got Visionary Technologies uh, started. And uh, at the time, I was a scientist and with a PhD in neurobiology and an MBA in finance. And I took an interest in uh, this contact lens technology that ultimately became Visioneering Technologies. Uh, about 20 years experience in life sciences management, uh, the management of medical sciences. And I guess it's uh, worth also mentioning somebody very important on our staff, Tony Summer. Uh, Tony is our senior VP of sales and marketing before joining Visioneering Technologies. Tony headed up one of the largest sales forces in the vision care industry, that of Bausch & Lomb in the United States. So very germane experience there. Uh, and my screen seems to be frozen, Mark. Give me just a second. Uh, there we go. And I uh, won't we'll go through all the board members here, but certainly worth mentioning about 150 years of combined experience on our board of directors in life sciences management and a management of medical sciences. Uh, most recent addition is Dwight Ackerman. Uh, Dwight comes to us after recently having retired from Alcon, where he was the uh, global VP of professional affairs and business development mergers and acquisitions and very, very germane to what we're doing at Visionary Technologies. Uh, so just quickly, what we do in a nutshell is we are a vision care company. Our flagship product is something called natural view multifocal lenses. These address two high need, uh, high medical need and underserved populations in the United States and outside the United States, very large markets. The first group of patients that are prescribed our contact lenses are children who are nearsighted. Uh, so nearsightedness means that a person or a child can see things up close, they cannot see things far away, uh, which is what we call myopia. And this is a really big deal. It affects 80 to 90% of children in many Asian nations in the United States. It's a quarter to a third of children. Uh, you're very lucky in Australia that uh, only around 10%, 11% of your children are nearsighted. Um, and a really important things to know about nearsightedness in a child is that it is a progressive disease. It gets worse over childhood. And the worse that the nearsightedness gets in the child, the higher at risk that person is throughout their entire lifetime for blindness and other really serious ocular diseases. Uh, it's about a $2 billion addressable market in the US, largely unaddressed by the large companies, but not for long. Uh, it's about a $10 billion market opportunity in China and obviously with Japan, Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, representing other large markets that are worth addressing. Uh, the other patient population that wears our lenses are people over the age of 45 who are losing the ability to see things that are up close. Uh, the medical term for this is presbyopia. Presby means old and opia, of course, meaning vision. So old people vision. And I, I think most of us would say, well, gosh, 45, 50, not really that old. Uh, that being what it is, once you are 45 to 50, you are very, very likely to start losing or may have already lost your ability to see things up close. These people are pretty easy to spot in a restaurant because they hold the menu really far from their face and they light up their iPhone and, and try to get additional light on the menu. Uh, or anytime you see somebody looking at their phone and they're holding it really far away from their face, the chances are they're over 45 to 50 losing that ability to see up close. And that's gonna be uh, over 90% of people over the age of 45 
are going to have trouble seeing up close. And this is also a prog progressive condition that gets uh, worse over time. It's about a $3 billion addressable market in the US. And it's worth noting that natural view multifocal lenses are the same for children and adults. It's the exact same contact lens design that we use on children and adults, which makes for a lot of efficiency in the optom's office. Uh, so just a little bit more on this myopia thing. Uh, so typically what happens with myopia is somebody figures out that a child is nearsighted, you know, under 10 years old. So you figure six, seven, eight, nine years old, it becomes apparent that a child is having difficulty seeing things far away. The historical old school way of dealing with that is you put some glasses on a kid or you put some uh, contact lenses on them, which can, gets them to see clearly. But unfortunately, just wearing regular glasses or contact lenses can actually make the child get, you know, their vision get worse, you know, and progress towards worse vision. And this is the progressive part of myopia. And so where this area has been heading more recently is recognizes, recognizing this need that not only do you need to correct the vision of the child so that they can see clearly while they're playing sports or at school, but you also want to keep them from getting worse. Going back to that previous point that the worse nearsightedness gets in a person throughout childhood and early adulthood, the higher at risk that person is going to be throughout their entire lifetime for blindness, cataracts, glaucoma, blood vessels growing in the eye where they shouldn't be. And so it's very important to intervene with nearsightedness very early. And that's been sort of a realization in the industry, a realization that parents are starting to see, especially uh, during the pandemic. Now, some of the things that contribute to nearsightedness in children and can exacerbate it and make it worse are not spending enough time outside, too much screen time. And so you can imagine that, and it's, it's been shown, that during the pandemic, we've had a really sharp uptick in the percentage of children who are nearsighted. And the numbers were already, already very, very high. So what can you do about this? Um, again, you have this dual need of needing to correct the vision and at the same time keep them from getting worse. A couple of ways of doing that. So soft contact lenses, that have very complicated, complex optics in them that can carry out this dual functionality. And that's where visioneering operates. We've been operating in this area for several years. And there's only two options in the soft contact lens space that fit this bill of needs, uh, that of visioneering and uh, another company called Cooper Vision, which is one of the major five global contact lens companies. Another thing that you can do is something called orthokeratology. Uh, these are hard lenses. They're placed on a child's eyes at night before they go to bed and while they sleep. These lenses actually reshape the front surface of the eye. When the child gets up, you can actually take these lenses off and because the eye has been therapeutically reshaped, the child can see clearly throughout most of the day, uh, at least until their eye starts to take its native form again. And there's a couple of things that happen here. Primarily, the child is able to see clearly, which is, of course, very, very important. But also, there's a side effect of using orthokeratology in that it can slow the worsening of the nearsightedness over time, the same as our soft contact lenses can do. And so, two solutions here between VTI soft contact lenses and orthokeratology that carry out this dual need of correcting the vision so the child can see and also keeping the vision from getting worse. Uh, another thing that is commonly attempted, used, uh, but not quite approved yet is a drug called atropine. Uh, atropine is an antidote for nerve agent exposure, so it's a pretty nasty drug uh, with side effect, a side, eff side effect profile that's non-ideal. But in the right patient and mixed up by the right pharmacist, atropine can be useful in slowing down the progression or worsening of nearsightedness uh, in a child or, or a young adult. With the side effects uh, not ideal and the fact that it's not approved as an eye drop uh, make it pretty non-ideal, but it, it can work. With atropine though, the child still has to be prescribed 
glasses or contact lenses so that they can see clearly. So uh, the two options that we offer here at Visioneering Technologies for providing clear vision and for minimizing the worsening of nearsightedness in children, Natural View Multifocal, which is our flagship product. This is a single use soft contact lens. You put it on in the morning, at, in the afternoon, uh, after a day of being able to see clearly uh, and slowing down the progression of the nearsightedness, you take these things off, you throw them away, and the next day put on a fresh pair. There's no requirement for taking care of these lenses. We have five years of evidence of children wearing our uh, contact lenses, so showing very strong safety and efficacy profiles. No special equipment needed by the practitioner, which is very important in lowering that barrier of uh, entry for using these lenses. And again, because they're, they are daily disposable, there's no need to sanitize or sterilize these lenses each day. You just take them off when you're done with them or the child is done with them at the end of the day and throw them away. Uh, very strong patent protection around our lenses in the large markets of China, United States, Australia, Singapore. Uh, and the other product that we are now offering, we just announced this the other day, we have signed a sales and distribution agreement for the United States with an Australian company called Innovatus, which is out of Adelaide. And what Innovatus did that was uh, so neat that we found so interesting and, and worth partnering with Innovatus was they developed a software program that makes designing orthokeratology lenses much more accessible to practitioners. Now, orthokeratology lenses are optically complex and each orthokeratology lens is a custom designed product depending on the shape of the patient's eye. And historically, that's been intimidating for a lot of optometrists and opticians. You know, they have to get special equipment to measure the eye. They have to have a lot of uh, specialized expertise to design the lenses. And what Innovatus of Adelaide did is they came up with a, developed a software package called iSpace that really simplifies lens design. And through simplifying the design process, it really opens up orthokeratology to practitioners who didn't uh, have the skill set necessary uh, to do contact lens design and didn't really want to go through all the training that it takes to do it. So it really simplifies it and opens up orthokeratology to a larger number of practitioners. And we will now uh, be selling and distributing Forge orthokeratology lenses. Uh, that are designed in the iSpace software system here in the United States. Just to give you a sense of how effective natural view multifocal contact lenses are in slowing or stopping myopia progression in children, the tall line that you see on the far left is the average amount of myopic progression in children that were studied using our lenses in a five-year study. And to give you a sense, you know, this is a diopter of change every year. And what that would, you know, actually look like to a patient, it would be like losing the ability to read a stop sign every single year over and over again. Remember, you know, nearsightedness is this progressive thing that gets worse over time. So the average child in our study was progressing about this diopter a year, uh, which is pretty severe. And after wearing our lenses, whether it was year one, year two, or all the way out to year five, on average, these children see almost no progression in their nearsightedness. So natural view multifocal contact lenses not only are providing these children with really good day-to-day -day vision, so they can go to school, they can play sports uh, comfortably, but also has this profound effect in keeping their myopia, their nearsightedness uh, from getting worse. So if you hadn't really heard much about myopia over the past few years, or you really weren't familiar with it, you could be forgiven because the large companies were just not in this space. Visioning Technologies is one of the first companies that really got out there with a product, really started trying to educate practitioners and parents on the importance of viewing nearsightedness in children, not just as an inconvenience that requires some glasses and contacts, but as a progressive disease that is a lifetime condition 
and if not properly managed, really can result in an elevated risk of blindness and cataracts and glaucoma uh, and other problems with the eyes. And the large companies just weren't into this space until very, very recently. And so J&J uh, &J Vision Care, for example, is the largest contact lens company in the world. And just a few weeks ago announced that it was going to start selling orthokeratology in the United States uh, for the management of myopia. And this is, this is just huge that the largest contact lens company in the world is now developing an entire brand. Uh, it's called Ability. And they put this entire brand and a new product into myopia management, which means that they're going to be spending a lot of money, tens of millions of dollars per year on educating parents and educating practitioners on the importance of managing myopia. And that really benefits, we think, uh, Visionary Technologies as a small company because we're, we're seen as one of the leaders in this area. Uh, Cooper Vision is another company that is in this space. I mentioned before that of the two companies in the world that have soft contact lenses that have been shown to slow down the worsening of nearsightedness, Cooper Vision is the other one uh, besides Visionary Technologies. They've recently entered the United States with their contact lens product and also offer an orthokeratology product as part of their portfolio. Menacon, the largest contact lens company in Japan, same thing, just announced a couple of years ago the formation of a brand called Menacon Bloom uh, for myopia management in children. And uh, they started off with an orthokeratology product, but didn't have a soft contact lens product. So partnered with us. Uh, right now, that agreement is only for Europe. It's a private label. And it's our, it was our first strategic deal. So that deal is a non-exclusive deal where we provide our lenses and Menacon's Bloom packaging for Europe. And really provides a lot of validation around our product and validation around the importance of myopia as a business opportunity that Menacon would partner with us. And so what you're starting to see here is the very large companies developing portfolios of products that include soft contact lenses and orthokeratology products. And the fact that a tiny little company like Visioneering has been able to do that uh, before Alcon, before Essilor, uh, and before Bausch, you know, with only J&J &J and Cooper Vision having accomplished it, the fact that a small company like Visioneering has been able to do that really says a lot about the strength that Visioneering has uh, in the vision care industry and our leadership position. And uh, again, just to give you a sense of the market sizes here, 2 billion in the United States, uh, around 10 billion in China, we have current approvals for our products in the United States, Australia, Europe, and Canada, Hong Kong, and Singapore. We're still working on China and Japan, obviously with China being the largest market in the world. And uh, we're putting a lot of resources into the clinical trial work that it takes to get that Chinese approval. But as it stands right now, we're already approved in much of the world and, and really just starting to launch into uh, visionary technologies being a global company. And just a quick reminder, you know, we haven't talked about this since the beginning of the presentation, but the exact same contact lenses that we use in children to provide clear vision and slow down the progression of myopia over time also have uh, great benefits for over 45 adults who are losing the ability to see up close. Our typical patient here would be somebody who has been nearsighted their entire life. They've been wearing contact lenses to correct their nearsightedness uh, probably since they were 9, 10, 11 years old. And then they get to 45 and not only can they not see distance, but they lose that ability to read things that are up close or see things up close. And that's a typical patient uh, that wears our contact lenses. We have a quite a bit of, uh, quite a few milestones and news coming up. Um, so just a few days ago, we made the announcement that we've partnered with an Adelaide company that um, 
make software for designing orthokeratology lenses. We're going to start the sales of those lenses in the United States in the month of August. Uh, and we're also going to be starting a clinical trial in North America. All the data that we have to date, the studies that have been done with our contact lenses are with a very particular trial design. And for us to expand into additional markets, for us to gain additional practitioners using our products, and also very importantly for our business development discussions, we need to have a different type of clinical data. And so we're starting those clinical trials. Uh, in the third quarter of 21, and we expect in the fourth quarter of 2021 to also enroll the first patient in our clinical trials that we need for approval in China. Fourth quarter of 2021, we'll also launch the next generation natural view multifocal lenses. We'll present six-year data of our lenses for myopia control. And perhaps most importantly, uh, at the end of the year or first quarter of 2022, we'll announce our full year 2021 results, which we are forecasting at around 10 million Australian, uh, 7 million US for the year, which would represent 40% growth over 2020. Uh, as we get into 2022, we'll have additional new product launches. And as we get at the end of 2022, beginning to uh, 2023, we'll release the interim one-year data from the controlled trials that we're going to be starting this year in North America and Asia, uh, which we do expect will catalyze further strategic discussions and market adoption. Also, uh, in the third quarter of 2021 and the fourth quarter, Menacon, which I mentioned is our first strategic partner, will be launching Menacon Bloom Day, which is our product throughout Europe. And other partners that we have in Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, will also be expanding uh, post-COVID as those countries exit from the pandemic. And things have gotten a, a pretty good start this year. So we just wrapped up the first half of 2021 with uh, 4.1 million in revenue Australian. That's up 52% over the first half of 2020. Uh, so we're well on track. We're annualizing to uh, 8.2 million Australian. And uh, we forecasted just under 10 with our strongest quarter, which is the third quarter of each year still in front of us. And we're very, very well capitalized. Uh, we raised 23 million Australian and a placement in STP uh, earlier in the year in March and April. And we expect that cash to be sufficient to get us uh, to or very close to break even and to fund all of the catalyst uh, I, uh, activities that, that I've mentioned earlier, which include new product launches, generating new data and launching new partnerships. And uh, I think that keeps us pretty much on time, Mark, and I am happy to spend as much time answering questions as uh, you have available. Okay, great, thanks, Stephen. Um, for somebody who's kind of followed it for a while, maybe could you just touch on, I know uh, last year, a lot of work went into reorganizing the, the sales and distribution function to kind of improve profitability. I'm just wondering how, that's been able to cope with things scaling back up in the US and, and have you been able to kind of maintain profitability with the kind of more streamlined sales function? Yeah, so just as a reminder, what we did last year in April of last year when the pandemic really started demanding fast and decisive action of companies uh, to address what was coming, we let go about half of the company we let go two thirds of the sales force. And um, you know, that, that saved quite a bit of cash. It positioned us really well for what we thought may be a prolonged pandemic. We also put a, a pause on new product development, a pause on new product launches, a pause on clinical projects. Uh, so quite a bit that we did um, to, to really position a company Everybody at the company took, uh, you know, pretty deep cash salary uh, cuts, and it got us through the pandemic uh, uh, really, really well. 
Um, third quarter of last year turned out to be one of our best quarters ever, surprisingly, as we came through the pandemic, or at least the, what we thought was the bottom of it. Um, and those accomplishments were achieved in a third quarter and a quarter since, which have all been really good quarters, again, with half the company and a third of the sales force that we used to have. So you're right that those reorganizations, those changes to the organization, um, you know, really had a profound impact on our cash positioning and profitability. The other thing that happened is that our sales force, the ones that remained, became a much more efficient and virtualized sales force. So, you know, if you look back at prior to the pandemic, if I went to my board and said, you know, I'm going to lay off half the company and two thirds of the sales force, and I'm going to deliver the same revenue. Um, you know, that, that probably went, would not have went over very well, but it's exactly what ended up happening. And so through virtualization of the sales force, through using, you know, phone, text, um, and not traveling as much, not being in as many cars as airplanes, the sales force operated much, much more efficiently and continues to do so to this day. Uh, we're very close to the sales force being break even on a per sales rep basis. So basically the sales reps uh, are starting to pay for themselves, which is really great to see. Uh, and we are starting to have to shift back, you know, a little bit towards a less virtualized sales model. Uh, but we're still retaining a lot of the qualities of the sales model that took us through the pandemic so efficiently, such as, you know, using Zoom meetings a lot more, using the phone a lot more, emails and text messages. So the simple answer to your question is yes and no. Uh, we are starting to return back to more traditional sales model, but nowhere near back to way, the way it used to be where all business was done uh, in person and consumed resources in terms of time and travel money. Uh, and we'll end up somewhere in between. Uh, but, you know, for growth purposes, it is important that we continue to invest uh, in new products, which we have been doing. And so, like I said, we've now teamed up for an orthokeratology product, which is huge news in the industry. So adding a, an existing product to our existing sales force to increase sales efficiency out of that sales force. And again, we'll be launching new products over the next couple of quarters uh, to, to do the same thing. And then what uh, final question we'll just squeeze it in here. Um I know you mentioned in the in the 4C um some supply chain disruptions out of Taiwan. It seems uh no honey are uh microchips being disrupted out of Taiwan. Uh, you've also had a few um issues there. Do you see that getting resolved over over the next six months? Um it, or is it do you think uh, maybe uh, a potential that you might need to look for a, a manufacturer um, on the U.S. side? So it's, it's really hard to predict. The, the biggest challenge we've had and a lot of companies uh, have right now are the logistical issues. And they're affecting everybody at every level of the supply chain. Everything has just slowed down to a crawl on global logistics which means that our supplier in Taiwan, as they try to gather their raw materials for making contact lenses are impacted. Uh, Taiwan does have an outbreak right now. Non-essential personnel are on lockdown. That hasn't interfered with manufacturing yet. What it has done, uh, two impacts so far. One is shipping costs a fortune right now. So where we used to be able to float lenses across the ocean, now we're having to fly them through the air, which is impacting gross margins. Uh, the other impact has been, of course, on the, the manufacturers themselves. But at this point, manufacturing has slowed down. Delivery times have slowed down, but not been you know, interfered with. Lenses are still coming. They're still being made. Everything's just slower, uh, taking longer to get to us. And if it doesn't get any worse, this will be just fine. It'll be non-disruptive. And right now, uh, you know, we're not seeing things getting worse. Uh, it's just sort of steady state settling down with longer delivery times and being more expensive. Uh, but I think we've hit a steady state and I'm pretty optimistic uh, that that will stay here. 
Okay, great. Stephen, that brings us right up on time. Um, I'd like to say thanks very much for joining us uh, late in the evening, uh, your time there on the East Coast in the US. And we will uh, look forward to all of those uh, announcements regarding everything you've got coming up over the, over the back half of 2021. Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity to present to the group. Uh, my email address was uh, shown on the screen. So if anybody wants to reach out to, directly uh, to me with questions or requests for a one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to do so. Great, thanks, Stephen. And uh, okay. we have our next presenter ready to go. Um, Joe Hanna, CEO and MD of Proctip Group. Uh, Joe, ready to go when you are. Excellent. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Mark, for allowing me to attend and thank you, everybody else, for attending this session. Um, given that I'm going to assume that most of you have not heard of PropTech Group or are uninitiated, what I'll do in this presentation, uh, given that it's my first to this group, is give a little bit of background into who we are, a bit of 101. Um, we have actually just released our 4C, waiting for the ASX to release that. So hopefully by the end of the presentation, I can give you an update on the company's performance as well. So jumping straight in, what is a PropTech group? Essentially, the PropTech group provides market-leading technology that really aims to streamline, optimise, and wherever possible, automate the way that residential and commercial real estate agencies operate their businesses. And by that, I mean we embrace agencies. We're not looking to displace or disrupt the agency model, but rather we provide SaaS tools, so technology as a software as a service, to enable real estate agencies in Australia, New Zealand, and increasingly the UK, to manage their back office operations. So you will see on screen the graphic on the right, just some of the tools that we provide to our agencies. Our mission is to be a leading investor in and operator of prop tech companies that serve the residential and commercial real estate agents, along with property managers in select high value markets. So what about products? In terms of our existing products, sorry, well, it's going a bit backwards here, apologies for that. Um, in terms of our portfolio of products, um, at our core, PropTech Group provides our flagship product as Vault RE. Vault RE is an all-in-one real estate agency management platform, servicing both residential and commercial sales CRM and property management modules. Now, to give you some context, a sales CRM in real estate is like an ERP system. It's a, it's a term that's been around for, for many years, but essentially a sales CRM is everything a real estate agency needs to run a sales division of their operation. So this includes a hell of a lot more than just um, contact relationship management. It includes everything from prospecting for new vendors, um, exclusivity, signing up vendors, listings management, advertising management, including pushing to the portals, social media, sales management, auction management, and settlement management, including trust accounting, commission management, and the like. So think of it as the core critical business system that a real estate agency needs to operate their sales division. Now, typically, um, in order for a real estate agency to run, they must have a CRM of, of sorts for run the sales division. But often, a real estate agency will have two divisions. They'll have their sales arm and their rent roll arm. And nine times out of 10, well, 10 times out of 10 at the moment, their rental arm is managed by a property management system, which is typically another provider. Where PropTech Group's products, and namely Vault RE, differs is we've built from the ground up a, once, a single solution that enables both sales CRM and property management in one system. What this does is provide a single view of customer, a single view of property, and more importantly for the principals and franchisors, a single view of the performance of their entire organisation. So to give you some history about PropTech Group, we actually started this business as real estate investor and floated on the IPO initially in 2015. Real estate investor, which is in the bottom right of screen, was a, is, is a, still a SaaS tool that enables residential retail investors to find investment grade properties in the most efficient way possible using strategy-based search. So by that, I mean, if you're interested in a development opportunity or interested in capital appreciation or interested in a yield play, you can essentially search every listing on the market in Australia and New Zealand and only match properties that are very specifically aligned to your investment strategy. So a very different user experience than you would otherwise see on realestate.com and domain. 
We floated that business in 2015 uh, and realized after a couple of years that the, the market opportunity was somewhat limited. Um, I joined as a NED at IPO and in 2019, I joined as an executive director to essentially right-size the business and evolve the business to what is now known as the PropTech Group. So essentially the PropTech Group uh, was a three-way merger um, between real estate investor, Vault RE and my desktop that we acquired from the domain group in March, 2020. We did via a reverse takeover, um, a, a, a relist in November, 2020 and rebranded as PropTech Group. So PropTech Group, as you see today, is essentially been public since November 2020. And just to give you some context, my desktop was founded in 1997 by the same founders of Vault RE. It was acquired by Domain Group, or then Fairfax Media, in 2007. Uh, as it happens, I was on the team leading the due diligence for that acquisition. And the founding team of my desktop stayed with the Domain up until 2016, when they left to develop Vault RE. All those individuals are still with our company and still in leadership roles. So since IPO, we've made a number of acquisitions that really aimed at streamlining, at, at growing our market share rather. The most recent of those acquisitions is the one highlighted in blue called Eagle Software. And we now announced completion of that uh, on Monday of this week after a successful $15.5 million capital raise. We've also added uh, additional capabilities and I'll talk to our strategy in a moment. Uh, in Designly, which is a digital asset management tool uh, evolving to become a pure campaign, end-to-end -end campaign management tool, enabling real estate agents to have control over the branding and automation of campaigns. So everything from signboards through to uh, paper uh, drops, print ads, and obviously digital, digital assets. Additionally, we've acquired Website Blue, the leading provider of real estate agency websites. Uh, because there's clear strategic alignment with our customer base. Renfine Inspector is a, small, uh, is a small but growing inspection tool that came to us as part of the Vault Group. And the acquisitions of both My Desktop and more recently Harcourt's inbuilt system, CRM, uh, were essentially acquisitions of customer bases. Both of those systems are being migrated across, or the users of those systems rather, are being migrated across to either Vault or Eagle, and those systems will be decommissioned, decommissioned over the coming months. The company currently operates in six locations, has over 100 staff and is growing fast. So why invest? There are a number of key highlights um, that talk to the, the investment. One is we are clearly a very innovative company, technology at our core with an open API and in-house R&D. We are releasing products at a rate of knots and we're continually evolving the products. To give you a, a, a bit of a sense, my desktop um, had not had any product up updates in over three years. We're releasing product updates weekly. So the reason we are winning customers is that they are very clearly seeing that we are evolving from a CRM and developing a whole bunch of tools that are really aimed at streamlining, optimizing and automating the process of running a real estate agency, which has a net effect of allowing them to be more profitable uh, and, more, uh, and more efficient. We are by far the market leaders, which you'll see in a moment, have a very strong export board made up of uh, myself, Simon Baker of REA fame, uh, Georg Schmiel of, of iProperty, REA and LJ Hooker fame, um, Sam Plowman, and of course, Scott Wolf, who was one of the founders of Vault Group. You'll see in a moment that we're well positioned in the PropTech ecosystem, because as I mentioned earlier, the CRM is the source of truth and a critical business management system. So over the last few years, we've seen a proliferation of prop techs, niche prop techs, particularly in Australia, that are emerging that, that solve one small part of the puzzle as we move along the value chain. In order for those prop techs to get anywhere, they must receive and send data to the CRM. So this gives us a unique opportunity to get really good deal flow and uh, get access to some really smart companies. Our strategy is to, to partner build or buy these companies, and I'll talk to our M&A strategy in a moment. The business is highly scalable in so far as 80, over 85% of our revenue is SaaS monthly recurring revenue with minimum 12 month contracts. Uh, we're scattered across three markets at the moment, our, our core markets in Australia and New Zealand, and increasingly investing heavily in the growth in the UK. 
We're a high growth, high growth business. I've spoken about the deal flow and clearly with the strength of our board have a number of international relationships in this space globally. We do see PropTech Group as a global business starting with Australia and New Zealand. But just to give you a sense of our leadership position, right now in Australia and New Zealand, the PropTech Group has over 38% market share in the sales CRM space by a number of agent offices using our product. To give you a sense of what that means in terms of the metrics, through our CRMs, we've processed over almost, almost $180 billion of property transactions over the last 12 months, paying out over $4.4 billion in agency commissions through the sale of over 240,000 properties. So although we're at 38% market share by number of offices, we're actually closer to the 55 to 60% market share by number of actual listings and properties sold in Australia and New Zealand. What's our growth from strategy and how do we, what's our growth strategy and how do we take this business from $100 million today, uh, noting that we IPO'd at around $30 million in November to a billion dollars? Well, it's underpinned by these four pillars. Number one is to increase our market share. Now we've done that since IPO and we will continue to do that through continuing to provide, to continue to secure large franchise group deals uh, of which we already have the largest franchise groups exclusively using our products today. Unlike our competitors, we're the only ones that have those exclusive deals and we, we intend to do more of them. As we use that base of sales CRM, we expand our product range, either through build, buy or partner and leverage the deep integration with our CRM in order to provide additional products and services to a centralized sales team. By doing so, we're able to grow our average revenue per agency per month through a centralized business account management and new business team, along with marketing, providing new products and services. It's important to note that a typical a real estate agency in Australia will spend upwards of $60,000 a year on prop techs scattered across at least 10 to 20 different prop techs. Our mission quite simply in the short term is to reduce the, those multiple ben vendors consolidate into one vendor being PropTech Group, thereby increasing our share of wallet and reducing their total spend on technology. Clearly we'll continue to look at and open new, uh, new geographies, starting of course first with the UK, which we've been running uh, in the UK for a couple of years, a year and a half now. So what is the market opportunity in the short term for our, our business in Australia? As we mentioned, we're at 38% market share of the sales CRM. But if you look at customers using at least one PropTech Group product, that market share grows to 40%. So on the chart below, you see the unique PTG customers being 4,922 agencies as of May 21. So there are still 7,200 odd agencies that we are not working with that presents a clear opportunity. But what's more important on this slide is to, is to show the technology spend on sales CRM versus property management. Typically property management software, real estate agencies will spend more than double on technology on their property management software as they do in their sales CRM. The fact that we have and are now launching our property management module provides a unique opportunity to grow, for us to grow rapidly off our existing customer base by providing them a single solution in one area. The makeup of our customers is broad and spread across um, the entire industry. And you'll see the mix of products being used by the large franchise groups and down the bottom, you'll see our, our large customers. So we have every single Ray White office across, across the world using our products, every single Rain and Horn office exclusively using our products, 80% um, plus of Harcourt's offices, about two thirds of, of PRD, about two thirds of professionals uh, and all of the e-group using our products. But what's important to note is our mix of products has evolved recently through the acquisition of Eagle. Vault, as I mentioned earlier, is very much enterprise grade and very franchise friendly. Through the acquisition of Eagle, we're now evening the keel so that we're able to service the small independents, the boutique offices, as well as the large franchise groups and everybody in the middle. What does this mean in terms of our ability to grow inorganically? Now, clearly we, we do intend to drive, drive growth through investment as well as um, acquisition. 
And by that, I mean the opportunity for us to move down the value chain within the, the, the workflows of a real estate agency provide us unique opportunities to not only buy other projects or partner with other projects, but also get into the adjacencies, which the REAs and the domain are pushing you too hard. Where we find the benefit for us is we have the captive attention of, of, of our audience at the appropriate time. So if you look at this eclipse um, diagram of the landscape, at the centre are essentially property participants. And by that, I mean vendors, potential buyers, renters, uh, landlords. Every communication from a vendor to a, an agent happens through our CRMs. Every communication from a tenant to an agent happens through our property management. So clearly we are already in that space and there's more that we can do to, to, to grow our revenues within that space. Since IPO, we've managed to do more in the agent marketing space. And this is not only agencies, we also provide service for services for agents direct. And our next evolution and target from an M&A perspective and product evolution perspective is in the finance, big data, um, research and analytics and online marketplaces. But let me start with finance. So if you think of mortgages, buy now, pay later, and vendor paid advertising, conveyancing, um, referrals, when you think about the experience from a consumer looking for a property on realestate.com, yes, realestate.com does provide home loans. But in reality, when you're in that mindset of search, what you're trying to do is find the home. What we know is that once a person hits the inquire to agent button, that gets sent to our software and every communication from that point on is managed by our software. So we know when people go for open for inspections, we know when how long it takes for them to return an agent's call. We'll know if they make a bid at auction. We'll know all these things about an agency and a person rather that realestate.com and domain don't know. More importantly, we know when they buy a property. It's at that time that we can offer them adjacency products like insurances, mortgages, finances, and the like. So we see those opportunities as significant growth opportunities in the intersection between prop tech and fintech. Besides those adjacencies, we have the core prop tech companies that are emerging within Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. As I mentioned earlier, each of these companies need to take data out of our, of our CRMs. We have a unique opportunity to partner with everybody but exclusively partner through deep integration with only a few and use the, the trials to understand whether those companies are worthy of acquisition. I've mentioned the UK and what we love about the UK in simplistic terms is it's twice as big and twice as backwards. There are over 25,000 real estate agencies in the, in the United Kingdom, given that we're all governed by um, um, Commonwealth common law, there are, there are some differences clearly in the way the UK operates, but fundamentally the market structure is not too dissimilar to Australia. Just like Australia, the technology spend in property management is far greater than that in CRM. The vault of the property prop tech group has a team on the ground actively selling into the UK. We have about 1% market share and we're one of the only providers providing a single solution for both sales CRM and property management in a single platform. Now, to give you an insight into our performance uh, financially, uh, you'll notice here that we have completed the acquisition of Eagle software. So I've split out the, the, the businesses so you can see the growth and the uh, financial contribution of Eagle software. Um, it, we've spoken about our increase in uh, market share in Australia and New Zealand. Um, Eagle also provides us an increase in ARPA being the average revenue per agency per month, um, growing us to now 225. Uh, and looking at our annualized monthly recurring revenue, taking June's, um, taking May's numbers times by 12, our run rate gets us at $15.3 million. Where we expect to land in FY21 is $11 million for PropTech Group standalone, plus an additional $3.3 million with Eagle, bringing us to $14.3 million as a combined group. And you'll notice here that we are EBITDA profitable or EBITDA um, positive. Um, it's important to note that we have a strong view of reinvesting for rapid growth in 22 and beyond. So very quickly on a, a pro forma p &L basis, I think we've covered uh, this off to a degree, but in terms of our pure SaaS revenues, expecting to land at 12, 12 $12.7 million, uh, 1.6 in, in other revenue, uh, and our EBITDA margin at about 17% uh, with a GP of 91%. 
uh, to give, in the interest of time to give us um, time to answer questions. Um, quick view of our balance sheet. Uh, this is a little bit outdated, but obviously will be updated shortly. Um, I mentioned earlier, our board, Simon Baker, some of you may know um, from REA, I, uh, Machula, iProperty, um, myself, a very quick background into me. I'm a technologist by trade, worked at Fairfax Media for about eight and a half years, left in 2009 to pursue prop tech startups. At that point, I joined forces with Simon Baker uh, and we've um, invested in, built and IPO'd a number of prop tech businesses um, on the ASX as well as globally. Uh, Scott Wolf is an executive director, uh, founder of the Vault Group, Sound Plowman is over 25 years in corporate, um, working at Domain when we acquired my desktop. And some of you may, may know George Schmiel, um, current um, executive chair of QI, IQI, uh, iCarRaiser, and has had a wealth of experience in the prop tech industry. Uh, I'll skip over our management team, suffice to say they've been experts in the space, and I'll end and open up for comments right on time with, with, with just one point around our 4C, which looks like it is in process of being released. Um, strong results, um, significant growth in our operating um, net cash flows and significant growth in our receipts from customers in the last quarter of last year. Uh, so with that, I'll open, I'll defer to you, Mark, with uh, questions and comments. Uh, thanks, Joe. Yeah, I'll keep a, an eye out on the ASX announcements uh, page here while we're running through questions, which there are quite a number of. Um, so let's um, let's start there. Um, can you maybe give a bit more colour context on how you're going to crack the UK market, given you know there's strong incumbents already in that market. I know you said you've got a team on the ground there, but maybe if you can just expand on that a, a little bit in terms of the strategy for the UK, the UK business. Absolutely. So we have been working in the UK for a number of years. First launched in the UK with our Rent Find Inspect product that has over 260 agencies using it. Um, we then, uh, over the last year and a half, have been tailoring and localising the Vault RE product, which in the UK is called Vault EA. Uh, and have been selling organically into that market um, through uh, testing and learning the best way to sell. Right now, we have um, companies like um, Century 21 in the UK and experts in property. Quite clearly, what we're doing in the UK now is really getting an understanding of the cost of acquisition in a on the, on the, on the ground team selling and banging on doors. In reality, it seems likely that the best way for us to grow in the UK is to replicate the strategy and the playbook adopted in Australia, which is likely to be an acquisitive one. So for the next 12 months, uh, without any imminent uh, acquisitions, we'll continue to grow organically, but in reality, uh, that will take time for us to get the same market share we have in Australia. So it's likely that M&A will be um, a, serious, a serious consideration for rapid growth in the UK. Okay, and then the next one, um, how does your pricing for CRM compare to peers? Um, and have you tested the elasticity and churn when pricing is increased significantly? Yes, uh, very good question. Our pricing has been significantly lower than our peers, and that's fundamentally driven by the fact that when we acquired my desktop, remembering that my desktop had, when we acquired them, a 26% market share, we essentially, um, as part of the deal with Domain, committed to not increase prices for 12 months. Um, that, is 12, that 12 months expired in March of, of, last, of this year. Um, we, um, and, and my desktop had not seen a price increase in, in over four years. So through the vaults pricing, we've increased prices by over 40%, which had no impact on churn. Uh, we're still below the pricing of our large competitors. To give you an example, uh, one of the, our biggest competitors is uh, Agentbox, the other is Rex. For a 50 user license, our, our, our rack rate is about 10K a year. Comparatively, theirs will be 50K a year and 35K a year respectively. Uh, so clearly we're sending a strong message to our customer base that we will increase prices every year. Um, it won't be super aggressive, but we certainly have tested and learned that uh, the price elasticity is certainly there without having a measurable impact on churn. Okay, great. And then another question on the UK market. Um, Super has bought a provider of real estate search portal uh, as well as CRM software. So are they not using the CRM functionality as a loss leader to gain ground on listings versus right move? So maybe just the competitive dynamics there. 
That's a very good question. And, and we see this time and time again in, in the property portal space globally, including including ourselves when I was at Domain and Simon when he was at um, realestate.com. So when you run a, a portal, the idea of owning a CRM is very attractive. In reality, every portal that buys a CRM quickly learns that it's a very different proposition to running a consumer facing high, high traffic portal. So typically what we'll find is that real estate portals will buy these CRMs combine them and then sell them. What we're seeing with Zoopla is they actually own 40% market share, but spread across five separate CRMs that are each running their own P&Ls. So it's less about using that data to um, gain access to more listings, but more about trying to understand the unit economics of running an agency and where, the, where their spend is. So yes, you're correct. The question is correct in saying that typically it's quite attractive um, to understand the, the unit economics of running agencies and leveraging that data to uh, fast track the growth of your of, of your uh, property portal. But in reality, reality, agents aren't really happy with the fact that portals know as much as they do through the CRM of their business. So typically over time, you'll see pushback from portals in adoption of, sorry, pushback from real estate agents in adoption of portal owned CRMs. And Domain found this, which led to them selling the business to us. We see this time and time again, globally, um, portals buy CRMs because they're attractive businesses in theory, very different to run, very different skill set. They then let them go. New CEO comes in, buys a CRM because they're attracted to the data, realizes it's hard and lets them go. So to be um, a bit more specific, we see an opportunity for some growth in the UK coming out of Zoopla's um, uh, entities and CRMs. Okay, great. Then uh, another question around um, the Eagle acquisition. Um, I know you mentioned, you touched on it, I think in your second or third slide of, of some of the smaller acquisitions where you're migrating the customers across to either Eagle or, or Vault RE to get them on a, a single platform. Is there potential for Vault and Eagle to be unified at some time in the future or would they all yes. do standalone systems? No, so the, the best way for me to articulate the difference between the two is that Vault is very franchise friendly and, and very feature rich. Eagle, think of Eagle as a scaled down version, which is very user friendly and allows people to start today, uh, sign up today and start tomorrow. Now, the back end of both of those systems are to, will communicate. So there's no reason why within the next six to 12 months, that a, a franchise group such as Ray White could have offices using some office, smaller offices using Eagle and some larger offices using Vault. They'll both talk to our franchise management system. Think of that as our data lake or enterprise reporting system. So the two businesses will, will be working together, but there'll be separate front ends to make to, to, to uh, provide a, a different experience for our users. One being simple, one being very configurable. Okay, and then maybe a final question, Joe, since we have a, a minute or two. Um, further expansions internationally, uh, is, is that something in the pipeline over the next 12 months or is, it, or is there enough to do between Australia and the UK that um, we, we shouldn't expect uh, entries into other international markets for, for the next little while? Yeah, very good question. Look, for, for the next 12 months, we have enough to do in Australia and the UK. Uh, certainly over the next 24 months, we, we, we see a strong um, opportunity to replicate our playbook in other markets. You know, the, those being North America, um, Europe and Southeast Asia. Um, look, at this point in time, it's unlikely we'll do anything meaningful in the next 12 months, but certainly the intention is over the next 24 months to be beyond just Australia, New Zealand and the UK. Okay, great. Uh, if we don't have any further questions, uh, we'll let Joe go. I'll just give it a second here to see if any are coming through. Doesn't look like it. Joe, thank you very much for, for, for coming on and, and joining us. Uh, I don't think the 4C has officially come. Let me see here. Uh, no, I don't think it's officially come through yet, but uh, I'm sure it'll come through in the over the course of the morning. And if you could just please stop sharing your screen, because I know Neil is patiently waiting for us uh, as our next presenter. 
Excellent. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. You saw my details on screen uh, previously. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out. Um, all the best. Thank you very much. Just wait for Neil now to start sharing uh, his presentation, and we'll. I've got it. I've got it sharing. Is it not coming through? Mark? I don't see it coming up on this side as yet, Neil. Let me just have a look and see what I've done wrong here, because it's normally me. Um, share the screen. Oh, yes. Hang on, just one second. My apologies. Can you see it now? Uh, still nothing on this side, Neil. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. okay. If it's I'll something on your side or something on my Let's side. Let's see what I've got here. Just check. That's enabled. It's coming through now, Neil. Yeah, I can see the cover slide now. There you go, looking good. Excellent, lucky I'm not in the technology business, Mark. <laughs> uh, if you could just turn up your volume a little bit, Neil, you seem to be a bit low on, uh, on volume. Yeah. How's that? Uh, yeah, better. Great. So we're ready to go when you are, Neil. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you for the opportunity to present the Australian primary hemp story so far, our last year and quarter, and what our outlook is for the next year. As our strategy of May 2020 outlined, we're a business that's transitioning from a bulk ingredients company to a branded value-added wellness company. It's driven by the underlying global consumer trend for sustainable and plant-based foods, products, not just food, all products. We have a capital structure that supports this plan and an engaged and supportive investor base that's looking for sustainable growth. Before we discuss how we're progressing, and I do this in every single presentation that I do, I'd like to just ensure we're all aligned around what hemp is and what hemp isn't. The hemp varieties that we grow are low in THC and CBD, which is between zero and 0.3 of 1%. Now, this isn't the marijuana that maybe some people on this call have used in their misspent use, not that I'm judging, but it's actually truly a superfood and a plant that has, has over 50,000 different uses from medicine, food, building products, fibre, just to name a few. It is the perfect mix of omega-3 and 6 polyunsaturated fats. It's rich in magnesium and protein and fibre and has no saturated fat. So it's actually the perfect superfood. In May 2020, we outlined a three vertical focus for the company and our entire effort is on innovating into these verticals and delivering high quality branded products. The three verticals that we identified were food and human nutrition, pet and animal nutrition and wellness and beauty. We chose them because they were large markets, they are well understood channels to market, consumers in these markets value innovation, all of these markets are in growth and there are global opportunities for us, all of which is underpinned by a strong consumer desire for plant-based and sustainable products. Our human nutrition strategy has two pillars, ingredients and branded value-added products. Our branded products under the Mount Elephant brand, which is named after the, farm, the first farm that we ever farmed hemp at the beginning of the business, were launched in September 2020, primarily via health food stores. Over the past nine months, we've been growing that footprint and have also achieved distribution in 7-Eleven, Woolworths and Coles. And additionally, now we're ranged in online platforms such as Nourish Life, Flora and Fauna, and goodness me, to name a few. And as COVID has evolved, these are becoming stronger and stronger channels for the consumer and stronger channels for us. With great customers and a strong initial marketing plan, we've seen our distribution grow from 280 stores to now 2,700 stores in Q4. Our pancakes, 
our pancakes and our, our superfood balls, our breads and snacks are growing in popularity as well as our snack bars and our hemp and oat milk, which is unique in the market. And they're not only providing great opportunity for, for our current distribution, but good growth as we move forward. Our marketing efforts continue as we, uh, as we, as we go. And we've seen our Instagram followers from zero to over 9,000, actually 9,200 as of today. And in our field day brand over 500 as of today and a growing loyal database, which will look to grow in the future and have a direct, a larger direct to consumer channel. Here's just some images of our, of our Mount Elephant product, which are currently on, on um, social media. In June this year, we launched our pet supplement range field day. It's only, it's, it, we launched it two months earlier than planned. It's a small range at the moment. However, our innovation plan has several new products uh, in the pipeline for later this year. The innovation has excited retailers and consumers, and we've gained support of the majority of major pet retailers as outlined in the slide. And uh, we're growing our independent store distribution nationally. So here's, a, here's an image of our field day range, four products to start with, three dry supplements, and one, sup and one wet supplement, innovative package, all plant-based and all absolutely delicious and of value add to pets. We mentioned in, Q in our May 2020 plan that we're planning to enter into the self-care and wellness vertical and our innovation, our innovation uh, strategy is on, on track for execution in Q4 of this financial year. Supply chain and operations has been a focus of our business as we continue to improve our crop and crop yields, uh, crop quality and product quality, as well as our manufacturing processes and outcomes. We don't compromise in this area. We had a record crop, which we announced earlier in the year. And as you would have seen in our 4C statement, which was released earlier this morning, we took some important decisions in terms of inventory management and quality to ensure that our, we continue to raise the bar as we move forward. In terms of Q4, we saw the first distribution of our products into the mainstream grocery and convenience store deals that we announced earlier this year. Due to some of the delays, primarily lockdown related in our customers' supply chains and their internal operations, um, we saw implementation delayed until just early July. So in fact, our implementation of our products ended as in have reached stores on July 15. This affected our Q4 revenue plan, which was slightly below Q3, but we're 133% ahead of our corresponding period in FY20. As stated earlier, we've written down some inventory that, are, that no longer met our higher quality standards. And we paid for the majority of our grain in Q4, which we do annually. So Q4 is historically always our highest cash outflow quarter because we pay for our grain. And, uh, and that's due to the seasonality of the crop. During the year, we made some changes to our board of directors and to our management with our founding chair retiring and our new independent chair, Pauline Gately, who was a non-executive joining as chair and she's assumed the role. Also further to increase our independence and improve our skills matrix, Shane Guild uh, has joined as a non-executive director. We've built a small and highly motivated and experienced management team who work tirelessly and I'm really grateful for all that they do and the board do to guide your company. So as we look forward, we continue to focus on the pillars that align to our strategy. We'll innovate to grow our brands. We'll innovate to improve, broaden and enhance our channels. We'll partner with our customers and suppliers to ensure we meet and hopefully exceed their expectations. We'll get closer to our customers and we aim to grow the value of your company. So um, over to any questions. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Neil. Um, just a, a, a kind of a broad question. Within the three verticals, are you aiming for a kind of a revenue of, of a third, a third, a third over, over time as part of the strategy? Or, or what kind of revenue mix would you like to see between those three verticals? Well, I think each of the, each of the markets um, grow at their own dynamic. Um, I, I'm not quite sure we have a clear plan on exactly what what those um, verticals will be because they're all growing at different rates. Um, so we will maximize our opportunities in each 
both from a product development and a channel perspective, as well as any international opportunities that, uh, that we pursue. So there's not a firm plan in terms of what that mix will be, but what we are completely driven towards is, um, is ensuring that we are focusing not only on our value-added our value-added branded area, but also our ingredients area, which I, which I didn't really touch on in the presentation earlier, where we see another exciting channel, both in, uh, in food as well as in animal nutrition. And uh, a follow-up question to that, in terms of the three verticals, can you give a sense, uh, even a broad sense of, of the GP margins within all three of them? Sure. So in our ingredients, our ingredients uh, category is our lowest gross margin category, which sits around that 20 to 35% gross margin. And, um, and, and that's, that's an area primarily which has been quite low value add for us. And so being a lot of exciting and innovative and interesting research work with some interesting parties to actually change that and add value add. In our value added, in our value added areas of, um, of human nutrition and pet nutrition, we're looking in the, in the um, very high 40s to mid, mid to high 50s. And in our, in, our pet, in our pet range, it's in the mid to high 50s. And in beauty and wellness, it's around similar levels, if not, if not a little bit higher. Okay, um, one from the audience here quickly. Uh, could you give a bit more detail on the marketing strategy for the coming 12 months, um, spend, channels, product focus, etc.? Of course. So our marketing strategy right now, now that we've gained our initial distribution, it's about gaining consumer awareness. So we have a belief that if you've got good products, you need to get them into the hands of consumers to try. So we are doing a range of a, a larger number of sampling exercises with our key customers and with their databases um, all, around, all around the country. A simple example of that is we work with one major retailer who has a large um, e-commerce business in, um, in, in, in activewear. And we've just done a sampling of 20,000 of our hemp bars, which are, which are going out in, into every single delivery. And that occurred last month. And as a result of that, we're starting to see greater engagement of our brand because it's driving consumers to both our online store and to the retailers where we stock. So we're doing a lot of sampling. We're doing a lot of work with our major retailers, um, primarily the, the, grocery, the grocery retailers in terms of promotion to gain trial, as well as working with, with their databases, um, in, with Coles, it's Taste Magazine, with Woolworths, it's Everyday Rewards, and working with their large databases to drive them into store to trial. We would do a lot more in-store sampling However, the COVID restrictions that are in place make it quite difficult for people to take off their mask and try and try product, which is a little bit of a challenge. We're also doing a lot of work in our, um, in our hemp and oat milk area, primarily in cafes and with baristas to drive trial and credibility there. So there's that. And then further and over and above that, a lot of work in the digital space, in social media and in e-commerce to drive awareness, working with key influencers, um, to, to gain awareness of the brands. And I know you, you briefly touched on it in the presentation, um, international. Uh, given, you know, you're in the, the, the very early stages of the rollout phase in Australia, are international opportunities more opportunistic where, you know, we all know that people are looking globally for, for new products for, for their customers. Is it if somebody comes to you, are you actively trying to crack into uh, one or two specific international markets. So, so you're, you're right, Mark, we, um, it, it's very early days for us to have moved, to have moved from this distribution of, of 280 up to 2,700 stores in the last year has taken all of our focus, as you can imagine. And that doesn't include the new pet food distribution, which was just, is just coming online this month. Um, so we are, we're really focusing hard on getting our core markets well bedded down with all the right systems, processes and programs in place. We have been approached because the, the, the joy of the internet is that people from all around the world can see us. So we've been approached by some major retailers in international markets. We're learning the channels to market and we're learning, and there's some of them are very similar to the, to the channels here. And we'll pursue those in a really structured way with them. The approach we take is very much a partnership approach with retailers. So we, we bring them on board in terms of our product development and our thinking 
and our, and our pricing, et cetera, to ensure we're successful. So we will begin engagement in a really structured way in international markets as we move forward, but there's nothing imminent um, as we sit here today. Uh, and if we, if we just talk about channels and distribution partners uh, as we speak, um, where are you in terms of the, the three verticals? It looks like, you know, food is pretty, pretty well established. Pets looks pretty well established. Is it now trying to guess uh, the health and, and wellness side um, set up in terms of multiple distribution partners? Is that something we should be looking out for over the next uh, kind of three to, to six months? That, that's right. So, so for us, for us, um, as much as we've got now a large number of distribution points in both um, animal nutrition as well as human nutrition, uh, we want to make sure that they are successful and we're getting the right, the right sell-through outcomes. And our early data that we're receiving from our, from our retailers, um, both in pet and in grocery, is very, very encouraging. The rates of sale uh, are on track with where we believe we should be as you are entering a new brand into a new, into a new market. So we are working in the, in the health and wellness. So we'll, we'll solidify those and make sure all those channels are successful. And, and they're dynamic trading businesses. So, um, so we've, we've obviously we manage that on a day-to-day -day basis. In terms of the health and wellness, we're still in product development phase of those and those product developments are going well. And as I said earlier, we work in conjunction with our retail and e-tail partners. So, so as a result, when we get time to, do, to go to their actual category reviews, which is a really structured review, program they're well aware of what we're doing and we've taken on board their insights so we'll be working both on product development and channel development in beauty and wellness as we move forward and we'll solidify what we've got at the same time yeah, great uh, another question here and um, where does e-commerce uh, fit into all of this um, given you know it looks a very distribution partner focused strategy but uh, is e-commerce uh, a kind of yeah, and, and nice to have, or is it a core part of um, your business in moving forward, but then you kind of kind of compete with your distribution partners? So e-commerce is a core part of, of how we go moving forward. Um, and we're looking, we've, we've, we, we have, we have um, e-commerce platforms for each of our brands at this point. Um, and, and that rate of sale continues to grow. So e-commerce and direct-to-consumer is core to our strategy moving forward. And we're working through some options now on how to really accelerate that growth. You have to have the brands and the value proposition right first. And we've now, we believe we've got the brands, we've got new product development, um, and, uh, and we've got those elements right, albeit relatively early. As I said, our distribution has really only just, just finished rolling out in the last couple of weeks. In terms of competition with, um, with our existing with our existing retailers, we look at it. We look at it slightly differently. We we will be bringing products that are specific to our e-commerce channel, which won't be available in the other channels, and we'll do that for a few reasons. One, to give a reason for someone to shop and get something unique on one of our e-commerce platforms. Number two, because it will allow us to trial those products and de-risk them as we understand the consumer behaviour there. And three, it means we can do small production runs and really learn and evolve products as we go forward. So we really see it both as a unique channel and a complementary channel, as well as, a, um, as, well as a, a trial and opportunity for us to get consumer insight as we move forward. Okay, great. And then, sorry, I had a question myself. It's uh, just slipped my mind at this point. Let me just check if we got another question from the audience uh, i don't see one now but my question was yes on on supply i know you you mentioned there that we you've just paid for uh your annual grain payment um in terms of accessing supply of raw materials to meet demand if you know you get a get a huge surge in a particular vertical or across all three verticals um how are you how are you managing, I guess, supply of raw material given the huge expansion in stores? So we, um, we, did, a, we did a detailed plan um, a year ago when, when I first joined the business on what we, what we would hoped to achieve. We, we, planted, we, we planted to meet that plan. 
um, and our yields and our outcomes from that crop were better than expected. So in that plan, we already built a buffer and then we had a better year, a better crop than we had anticipated. And agriculture is a wonderful thing in that regard. So as we move forward and we've already planned and completed our planning for our next financial year, we've taken a detailed view by vertical and by product and aligning with our new product development, uh, exactly what we think our needs are. And not only have we built for that, but we've now built a reasonable buffer in there to be able to meet those needs. So we think we're well covered. That's number one. Number two, um, we only, we only, um, we only uh, harvest once a year. Uh, and it's a short harvest. It's only it's only fourteen weeks, um, so we um, we plan for that. We we plan for that well, and to ensure that we're um, we're well covered as we go forward. So we think we're in we're in pretty good shape. Okay, we have got two more questions from the audience, Neil. Um, e-commerce customers, what proportion of sales are you seeing from new versus repeat customers? Might be a bit early days in the direct to consumer uh, um, business to to give some concrete trends, but maybe as maybe some high level thoughts on that? Sure. So um, as we said, in these channels, people are really looking for newness. So we're getting a lot of the, the number of visitors to our sites just continues to grow, to grow every day. When I said to you, we were at 9,200 followers on Instagram. When I got onto this call, we we're at 9,100. So we're growing quite rapidly. What we're seeing in terms of click-through rates and, and retention rate, we're seeing a returning customer rate in our Mount Elephant brand of about 34%, which is really, really high. And as we're doing work on our ADMs, et cetera, we're seeing, we're seeing click-through rates in, in, the, in the five, sixes and seven percents. Now I'm told from people who have large e-commerce businesses that those statistics are, are strong and very encouraging. Um, and it's all about the content that we're putting out there and then the customer service that we, that we provide at the e-commerce back end. So, so far it's encouraging, but to your point, it is early days. Um, and I think, I think as the database gets bigger, we might see some of those statistics decline slightly, but what we will see is a number of people that we're engaging with increase. Okay, and then the, the next question, do you foresee more write-offs of inventory in the near future? Look, uh, the answer is no. We, um, we took a decision, we took a decision on that inventory, which was primarily older bulk ingredient um, inventory, not our value added products. And, and we did that because as part of our, our raise, creating and then raising our standards, we realized that we needed to, um, to really improve, improve our game. So rather than, rather than um, um, continue, not continue, rather than have any product in our system, as we came into the new financial year um, that, that would not meet those new standards, we decided to, to do what was prudent, we believed, and, and write that off and dispose of it. So no, we, we, manage, we manage all of our production and all of our um, demand planning through a very detailed weekly sales and production forecast. Um, and then we're managing both the back end and the front end of our business very closely. So we don't anticipate significant stock write-offs moving forward. Okay, great. If we, let me just check if we got any further questions there. I'm going to give it a minute to see if we have another one or two, uh, but if not, we might um, leave it there. So I don't see them coming through. Neil, I think we will leave it there. Thank you very much for coming back on and giving us an update on everything uh, Australia primary hemp. It was great to great to get the update this morning, and uh, yeah, we'll keep an eye out for the the products uh, on shelves as we move through the year. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you everyone for attending. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, everyone. And just a reminder: and uh, the recording of Neil's presentation, and indeed the presentations from our first uh, three presenters this morning should be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow morning um, for anybody who may have uh, been late joining us or uh, missed out on the start or end of somebody's presentation as we have been uh, slightly ahead of time as we've uh, progressed through the four presenters. Our next event is happening tomorrow morning where we've got another four companies presenting and hopefully some of you can join us for that.
Okay, thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.